I'm Jennifer Lay with Mississippi Main Street, and I'm so excited that you guys are in here today to hear about a, an existing and new and upcoming project in Starkville, Mississippi. And so this morning you are going to have Mayor Lynn Sproul. Um, she needs no introduction because you've heard from her multiple times this week, which we're very excited about. Um, she has a history as a former mayor in Texas, um, in the Navy, as a pilot, and she is currently my wonderful mayor, who I'm very proud of. Edward Kemp with her is one of her side kicks in the city he is over the street department and is city engineer and so he is in charge of of everything that you see and drive on from a visual standpoint and then also we have John Hargraves with us he is a national brownfield manager for PM environmental and so he is working on this project with them as the consultant and so I'm gonna let them go ahead and get started I do want to say that I do have the AIA spread um, sign-in sheet so if you are getting AIA credit for this course um, I will have this at the end when I pop back in so y'all enjoy Thank you so much, Jennifer. And thank you everyone for being here. I see a lot of familiar faces who already know about this project. So thanks for filling in for us. Nah. Um, and I'm just gonna be the, the fluff that goes ahead of the real substance, which is gonna be these guys. But what I do have is something they don't have, which is a history of the now 182, but when I was growing up, which was multiple, multiple years ago, uh, it was 82. It was the primary the primary corridor going through Starkville. And so, you know, I remember my father had breakfast every morning to the Plantation Bell, which sat on 82. And we had the, the Pick Pack grocery store and we had, you know, uh, the local grill. And we had those kinds of things that uh, <clears throat> I have fond memories of, clearly. Um, but it was, the, it was the corridor, it was the 12. It was the Highway 12 for us at the time. And then we had Main Street, and so the two of them were tied together. And so as cities do, 182 began to deteriorate as 12 opened up, and 12 became much more robust, and, and 82 uh, went into a great deal of pretty much disuse, with except for a few things, and Chip, you remember, remember some of that, right? You could probably fill in as well. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as that happened, then you saw that disuse, you know, the cities swing from one area to the next. And, and if you don't catch it on the downslide, downside, downslide, then it takes years to bring it back. And that's what we're doing right now. We're at a point where we need to bring it back. And so, oddly enough, this whole thing started when I was the chief administrative officer for the city and we were doing a brownfield project. And um, I had a little hiatus there where I wasn't involved in the community or in the city. Uh, under administration or as an elected official, but these gentlemen carried it forward. So 2013 was when this whole thing started with the Brownfield, and so we are now 2021, and we're not nearly done with it, so it just tells you how long it takes to get there. Um, but the Brownfield project started us down the road, and a charrette, all of that together, high highlighted how we needed to do something with 182, and this was a prime corridor for us to do something. And so uh, as we worked toward that, it came very clear that it needed some sort of revitalization. And we were fortunate enough with surrounding community support, Dr. Keenum, our, our legislators, um, the county, all supported us in moving forward with a bill grant from the Federal Highway Authority. And I made that uh, required trip up to, up to Washington and, and sat, at, sat in front of Senator Wicker and Senator Hyde-Smith. And, and in 2019, we were, were awarded $12.66 million, and the city's got a 20% match, but that $12.66 million is the largest grant the city of Starkville's ever received. And so we are um, well into the inner workings of it. It is incredibly complex, and beyond that, I know nothing. But these gentlemen right here are gonna be able to give you some, some details, but it, it is truly one of the most complex projects I think even that the Highway Transportation Authority, the MDOT, the engineers, and everyone has seen because you're talking about underground utilities, utilities already that are already there, utilities that you want to take there, and how do we do all that and coordinate? So I'm very proud of Mr. Kemp, who is actually interesting enough, Edward has been our city engineer for how many years, Edward? 13, 13 years. Damn, it doesn't seem like it. 13 years, and his father is our department head for the utilities department. So between the two of them, it's a family affair and how we're going to make Starkville the very best we can be. And so who's coming next? John, are you coming next? All right, then uh, John Hargraves, who, who dealt with the... Okay, Edward's going to. You want to tell them about Johnny Cash, don't you? Well, a little bit, yes. 
So. This is where John, Johnny Cash also, we now have a country music trail marker. Johnny Cash was picking flowers of our local, one of our high profile local doctors. His wife's, his wife's yard, you know, two in the morning he was picking flowers. So we now have a, we now have a country music trail marker that, that denotes that. So, Edward, I'm going to leave it to you. If there's anything else, call me. Okay. Thank you. And the mayor does need to, to go. We have a work session starting uh, just in a few minutes. So, uh, but if you haven't been down to 182, uh, take a look. We do have the new uh, country music uh, trail marker there that is currently in an open space, and we're trying to incorporate that. You'll see in a minute um, when we show you the plan. We're going to incorporate that into a public space, and that'll be kind of one of the marquee uh, portions of that. But obviously, this is a part of the history of our corridor, and we want to capitalize on it. And, it really brings some attention to it, along with the other things that the mayor has talked about, but all these other aspects of the, the corridor that, um, that, are, that are different, that are unique, um, that are uh, uh, unique to Starville, I guess, and, and things that we don't want to necessarily forget about, but obviously um, highlight going forward in this new project as well. So for those of y'all that uh, don't know, I, I'm an engineer by trade, uh, as you know now, but I love maps. I love looking at maps. I love looking at how things progress. So this is a map from probably the 1950s of the city of Starville, okay? An old USGS map. It's probably a little bit blurry here. But as you can see, 182 is right here, coming right through the heart of, of town. This is Highway 12 right here, okay? Um, so this is, this is from the mid... Uh, midpoint of the last century, and then this is a more recent uh, update of that same, uh, generally same scale, but an update map. And do y'all see the primary difference in that, that that occurred probably in the last 20 years in the city of Starville, is this uh, bypass going around the, the western side and the northern side, um, as you can see, was not, not there previously. This changed a lot of our community, and the mayor talked about the ebbs and flows of the community and from a transportation standpoint, it definitely changed it because a lot of the large commercial traffic that was coming right through the middle of town on that, if you remember seeing that map that shows it going from New Mexico all the way over to the, to the East Coast, um, there was a lot of heavy uh, commercial traffic, 18-wheelers coming essentially right through the middle of town. Well, now those, that traffic is utilizing these outer perimeter corridors. Um, and then this is just an update of some of the traffic uh, counts that that are representative along those you can see anywhere from six, 15 to 16,000 vehicles per day are now utilizing these perimeter corridors instead of coming right through the middle of 182 which is still still highly traveled but from a from an overall use standpoint the change has changed dramatically uh, because there's a lot less commercial traffic um, so with that change, with Highway 12 becoming kind of the new uh, commercial corridor with the bypass occurring, as you can imagine, things have changed on Highway 182. There's been less investment. Um, there, is, there is a lot of really old infrastructure there um, that has become a little bit antiquated. We have, if you notice this picture here, you can see all the overhead utility lines. I mean, 182 serves as a major circuit uh, conduit for all the electrical lines because we have a, essentially a substation on the east side of the corridor and the west side and it serves as a as a major link between the two as well as all the telecommunications throughout the city this was kind of again the main corridor going back to the to the uh, 1930s 1940s so with all that comes um, you know some some issues with property ownership maintenance um, and really what we would like to see is a place where people are willing to come and invest and um, you know, redevelop. So that's kind of what kicks us off with the, the Brownfield. I'll let John take over from here. Thank you, Edward. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for sticking around. Y'all need that too. Um, I know we're kind of like the last line between you and, and heading home, so we appreciate you being here. Um, so what I'm going to do with this is discuss uh, the brownfield component of how we went from the idea of what needed to be done on 182 to getting some funding to actually do some of it to set the stage then for Edward to discuss the Build Act and where we're going from there. So Mayor Spurl talked about this starting in October of 2013. It actually started, even though I agreed with her, it did start, the funding dropped in October 1, but it actually started in 2011. 
it took us two attempts to, to win this EPA grant. If, if you're familiar with these EPA grants, this assessment grant is zero match, and it's very competitive because of that. So only about one in five are funded every year. So it took us two tries to get to this. So you have to kind of go back to a, to go back a couple of years from that. But we did win $400,000. Um, the funding dropped October 1st of 2013. As part of the application, it's a community, they call it a community-wide grant. Any eligible site could be looked at within the city limits of Starkville. But we looked at particular parts of Starkville as part of the application and then they became the focus area. So you see kind of a quick list up there. One was the Highway 182 corridor, uh, which we've already kind of done a little bit of, of, of history on. Part of that was assessing properties, and you'll see some pictures I'll talk to you about here in a second, and then also this corridor plan, and I have a copy of the plan. It's kind of dog-eared, and because and, it's, it's made the circuit with me quite a bit, so it's, it's kind of a beat-up version of it. But I do have the plan if you want to you know, flip through it and take a look at it. Um, the other story that we told in the application was the old MSU landfill up in Research Park. So we did do some assessments on that, and at least got it to a point where there was some cleanup planning to know what the cost was. And, but, it, you know, that was kind of where our piece ended there at that point. But we ended up, through the three years of the grant, we ended up assessing 18 sites within the city of Starkville. About 30 tasks of those 18 sites, which would have been different assessments and cleanup planning. And then also the corridor plan that were really is the topic of what we're talking about today. And that was probably 25% of the budget, I guess, was, was, the, uh, was the corridor plan. So a couple of pictures here that you can see, the one on the left or one on the right. Uh, the locals may even, they guys probably know more about these buildings than I do and, and recognize them. I, I looked at them from an environmental standpoint. But the one on the right is the Macaulay Tire, old Macaulay Tire property on 182 down near the school. I can't remember the intersection down there. Um, looks much different today. That was when it was, was this, w before we assessed it. Um, now, if you drive through there, it was redeveloped by a landscape architect, um, and it, it does look much different now than it does, t uh, than it did then. On the left is an old gas station that's at the corner of 182 and Jackson Street. And again, if you're local, you've probably driven by this thing for years. It was an old Humble Oil property that was built, to, the station was built in 1933, so it's an Art Deco. Behind all of that ugly metal, there's actually an Art Deco style structure there. So uh, the, the original intent of this building was it was going to be the site of Humble Taco. And that's where the name comes from. If you didn't know that, the Humble Oil was where the Humble Taco came from. And they ran the pro formers, they looked at the business model, and it just was not going to work in this building. So it is now up on university. Uh, so I actually ate there this week, maybe some of you did as well. Um, so it exists, but that's the history. So hopefully something else will come of this property down the road um, would, would be the hope of it. So that's a couple of examples of sites that we assessed as part of the 1A2 corridor. You may have heard this term, I've I said brownfield probably 20 times t today, and you might be going, what the heck's a brownfield? What is he talking about? If, if you're not familiar and you don't know, that first bullet, I'm not going to read it, the first bullet is the official EPA definition of what a brownfield is. What I tell people is it's a piece of property, a piece of real estate, that either is known to have some sort of environmental impact or there's a perception that there's an environmental impact there. So it's a scary looking building. It's had some kind of history to it. I'm not touching that building because there's got to be something wrong with it. What, so that, that really is the term of a brownfield. It doesn't have to be a large industrial facility, though it can be. Many of the ones we work on are small. These small little postage stamp properties that may have been gas stations or dry cleaners or had some kind of history to them or even had an old building that may have asbestos in it. You know, it can, it's a fairly broad kind of definition. So we're here to talk about the corridor. So this piece, the charrette that happened, um, it happened in 2016. So this was kind of at the tail end of the, of the three-year grant. So it started out in 2016 with the team who was going to be doing the plan. So that included representatives from the city, 
It included the lead designers and, and other folks and were put together the team that would have all the public engagement and would create the plan. We looked at this from many different lenses. So it was economic, it was historical, it was cultural, uh, transportation, it was infrastructure. There was a lot of moving pieces and we needed experts in each one of those, pe in each one of those areas to really dig into the corridor and come up with a complete story of what needed to be done there. So you can see the pictures. If you're local, you may recognize some of these faces. I'm, in, I'm standing in the back with a camera on the one on the top. Um, that was my role was photographer at that point. Um, so there were a series of public meetings and you can see the invitation that started in June. So this was in late June of 2016. There was a series of public meetings where people came and gave their ideas about the corridor. What needs to be here? What ideas do you have that you think would revitalize 182. We spent a week in the City Hall, I guess that was the new, uh, recently opened City Hall at that point, so we kind of took over part of the City Hall. They were kind enough to let us spread out in one of the rooms there. And we continued our discussions with citizens. We did, we did more research. Uh, we were doing renderings of some of, the, uh, some of the goals and the ideas that were part of it. And then we had a closing presentation at the end to really give a very preliminary idea of what, what our findings were. Then everybody broke off, the team broke back apart. There was a draft document, maybe even a couple of draft documents that were done that had, that were then brought to the city for more public comment, more questions. The final document uh, that was in early October of 2016 would have been then as a final document presented to the city council and there would have, been, would have been an approval process through that, so that we, so we had that final document. Um, so it was a, it was a fairly long and, and intense kind of kind of process that we went through. So what we've got at the end, um, there is the little graphic to the right talking about the plan. So it really went down two tracks. So there was a private private side to this, a shorter term private side, two to five years, that was more nimble, it was more flexible on what would, have, what would happen, it was concentrating more on individual properties along that corridor. And any investment that was made in those that would have been on the private side would have fit the business model of that particular company, that, that budget, so whatever they were, they were going to do, and it, and it would have that shorter term. The longer term, the nine to 12, was the public investment. That one is less flexible. It would have followed this plan that was put together, this vision that was put together, and a lot of it then was funding. How are we gonna find the money to do this, this particular kind of project? Um, so, uh, so those are really kind of the two pieces that you see us working through here. And so we're gonna really be talking about what happened on the public side with the Build Act. So that was one, at this point, I kind of stepped out of the picture from a Brownfield perspective, at least on the public side, from the Brownfield perspective, and then the city took over working with, uh, to, fill out the, uh, the, to, to fill out the Build Act grant. So I think at this point, turn it back over to Edward, and he's gonna walk you through the process with the Build Act. Thanks, John. John's been such a great partner for us uh, throughout the years too, and um, really like helped propel us forward in that. And that that charrette document really was the catalyst that we use going forward for our build grant application. And another thing that came out of that charrette, I, I really like that slide. That's okay. We can talk about it then. Uh, this is the charrette that actually came out of it, and this is kind of one of the graphics, but. I'll just highlight that either end of that corridor, this is, that kind of set the frame, if you will, of what the termini of our project that currently exists today. It has a lot of the same ideas. This is an extension of downtown. And this is kind of just a, a different view of that. 182 is up on the north part. And everything kind of shaded red is what we would consider our downtown Main Street, kind of transitions into University Drive. I hope y'all have had a chance to, to visit our downtown while you've been here. It is vibrant, it's active. Um, we have great leadership there. 
uh, at the Chamber of Commerce in the, in the Main Street group. Um, our, part, our downtown partnership really does a great job of promoting it. Uh, we have very few vacancies down there. Uh, a lot of people want to locate there. We have a lot of festivals and events. It's just a great, uh, great asset for our community and um, very vibrant. And the idea was how could we take that, uh, that same idea, that same kind of landscape and, and move it uh, or expand it, not move it, expand it, um, essentially just a block and a half, two blocks to the north. And uh, that was one of the main things that came out of the charrette is basically expanding our downtown because um, it, it is very uh, is a very vital component of our community. Um, so, like the mayor said, we uh, persistence maybe is one of the the things that we we uh, we're maybe good at um, because we don't give up very easily. Um, as we applied for the the assessment grant a couple of times. Um, we also applied for the bill grant a couple of times, and we're, we're not successful the first time, but we, we, did, uh, we were successful the second time, and we got the $12.66 million. Um, but part of that is we, uh, we, we made it really lucrative, I guess, for the feds in that we were going to offer a 20% match as well. Um, it's not necessarily required to do a 20% match, but we, we uh, chose to, to offer that to make our application a little bit more competitive, and we did which brought the total project up to around $16 million. Based on some of the pricing that we're seeing here lately with the increase of, um, especially the electrical uh, materials, we're looking really now in the 18 to $19 million range right now. So we'll have to figure out how to, how to rectify that um, as we go forward. But like the mayor said, one of the largest, uh, most impactful projects, at least from a transportation standpoint, that our community has ever seen and so let me walk you through just a couple of the components of the plan and kind of how we took these ideas from the charrette and kind of what is, uh, what is on the table right now is in, in hopes of what we'll have actually have constructed. What we have, um, if you go back to that original charrette document, we have uh, an end cap on either side of the corridor. One starts at Long Street, one starts at Old West Point Road. And we're really trying to create gateways as you enter into the corridor. We want it to feel different when you're, uh, when you're kind of entering that kind of downtown area on 182. If you're coming from the, the west, it's really more of a rural type roadway section, what you see typical in Mississippi, just a two lane um, roadway, um, just the, the, the type of development and, the, and residential there is, is kind of conducive to a rural section. And then over on the east side, which is closer to university, it's really more of a highway type arterial type section. You have a five lane roadway that ties into another highway uh, right there. So again, two totally different roadway contexts coming in, but we want those to feel different as you're approaching downtown. So with that comes uh, enhanced landscaping. We're gonna uh, actually uh, uh, tighten the road down. We have uh, decorative crosswalks on either end. Um, we also see, you can also see up here, oh, what did I just do? I'm sorry, there we go. Yeah, I put you on the wrong button. So this is the, this is the west side, this is 182 coming into Long Street. Um, you can see where we're adding a turn lane there, and we're actually adding some medians throughout the corridor here. This is where um, our local uh, second through fourth grade school is, so there was a big um, component um, that we needed to make sure we address that with the school drop off and pick up and and all the traffic concerns that come with that right here in this area um, we had a lot of um, questions about trees you know like why are you putting trees in the roadway um, you know that are you sure you want to do that are you sure that's kind of what we want to do and um, so there has been kind of a change in in mentality um, and I will say that our Department of Transportation, specifically our district, um, uh, District 1 for MDOT, has been incredibly supportive. Um, they've been very open-minded to, to these ideas, which, were, which are traditionally not um, in their wheelhouse for um, highway uh, roadways. Um, so I, I really want to commend them and thank them for, for, for their partnership on this as well. But as you can see right, now, right here, this is right in front of the school. I did it again, sorry. Um, this is the school right here. We're gonna have a new enhanced drop-off lane here with that's separated from traffic, so we hope, hope that that will be a lot safer. We're doing decorative crosswalks throughout the, 
the, um, the project, and we're adding a 10-foot uh, multi-use path on either side of the, of the street, starting all the way at the beginning of the project at Long Street. So really increasing the biking and pedestrian uh, mobility options along the corridor, which we think is important to create a place where people want to be, where people want to go, uh, where people want to invest. So uh, we're, we're essentially creating that pallet there. As you continue on, uh, Dr. Dale Connor Drive, which he, that, that was a picture of him on the initial slides, one of the early, uh, the first African American doctors. This uh, this roadway is named for him. This is essentially what is starting of what we call the core, and that is the two block section directly adjacent to to the downtown. Um, so the core is actually we're, we're, when you enter that, we want that to feel a little bit different than the rest of the corridor too. You can see that the, the streetscape changes a little bit there. Um, we actually have a separated bike path and then a separated uh, walking path or sidewalk in this section. Uh, much more enhanced landscaping. We have a lot of furnishings uh, there with, a, a, we, of course we have street trees all the way through, but we have pedestrian lighting. We have, you know, the, the benches, that type of thing in this core two block section, which, which again extends all the way to Jackson Street. That, that, uh, Art Deco uh, gas station that John was alluding to earlier is right here on the corner, which um, if you know Startwell very well, this is a state highway, Highway 389, that comes directly in to, uh, to town from that northern bypass. So this is an important uh, link here as well. This space right here is, uh, is, is now owned by the city. It's something that's, acqu that's been acquired really since the charrette, um, but it was included as a potential green space uh, we're hoping to expand our uh, to, a, to a downtown public park, public space at some point in the future. I don't know that we'll have the budget for it as part of this project, but this is be where um, the Johnny Cash um, marker will be highlighted. And um, again, a lot, of, a lot of potential and opportunity for that area. Um, again, see the enhanced landscaping here. And then for the remainder, we're taking essentially a three lane roadway section and we're narrowing it down to two lane section here. Obviously we have turn lanes at the major intersections, um, but, but it's, 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 it's a change in how we're allocating that public space. We're, we're taking more of the, what is typically used as asphalt and roadway and reallocating it toward uh, the pedestrians and bi bicyclists by adding the, again, those multi-use paths on either side. Adding the enhanced landscaping all the way through. This is Montgomery Street another major intersection and then how uh, Old West Point Road is the end of this project and again you see the five the five lane section here that that goes uh, directly into the university we're adding a uh, a turn lane here and again trying to do some enhanced landscaping on this end of the corridor so we're trying to create a gateway um, it's a very um, you know complex project as the mayor said you know this is everything you see from the surface um, but there's so much that's underneath the surface that we're we're addressing to the storm drainage system is is undersized is is old we have sections that are completely failed um, and collapsed we have a lot of really old water lines and sewer lines that will be included as part of this project but also that picture that I showed earlier about that spaghetti of wires overhead 90 percent of those 95 percent of those are now either going away from the corridor or they're going underground which is incredibly hard especially in sections where you have very limited right away like this section from jackson to montgomery is very tight and we have grade issues you have all these other things and you have obviously only so much room to do it both above the ground and below the ground so we are taking everything underground that you see overhead right now with the exception of that major transmission line that again connects those two substations. That was something we learned early on in the project that was just not feasible to put underground both from a cost standpoint, but also that was one of the things that MDOT said that, you know, that's really kind of not something that we're going to allow from a, just from a long-term safety standpoint. So we understood that. And uh, so what that looks like, though, is we're putting those uh, high-voltage transmission lines on really high um,
concrete poles that are going to be spaced like 500 feet apart. So hopefully they will blend into the landscape a lot more than you, uh, than you notice now and will be a lot less intrusive um, for, the, for the corridor. So uh, this is kind of a, a, a photo or rendering of what the core area looks like. Again, the extension of downtown. You'll see that we have the, uh, the bike path that is separate from the, the large uh, sidewalk all the furnishing zones here and again we're trying to create a palette back to what john said the purpose of the plan is is a public uh it's a public component but it's also a private component the public component is we can do everything we can do inside the right of way to make sure that the infrastructure is sufficient and that it creates a palette where people want to come where they want to be and ultimately where people either want to invest or redevelop their property um, so that's what we're hoping that this will be. This is our general timeline. Uh, we're still actually working on the plans right now, but we hope to have those done this fall. Um, there's probably a year, a year's worth of just utility work that's going to happen um, by t putting an underground duct bank, moving some of the, the trend, uh, distribution circuits off of the corridor and offloading them other places in the, in the city. And then what we'll probably see is this time, uh, next year or maybe the spring of 23 is actually work starting on the roadway but I'll be honest with you uh, it's going to be quite the uh, quite the war zone for a couple of years I see a couple of uh, Starville residents in here and it's just going to be one of those things where it's going to be painful for a little while but at the end we think it's going to be a great a great project I hope to be done by 23 um, is our goal right now so I think that's all I had John That, that Edward actually mentioned to me specifically to include in there, and then I forgot. So, and I didn't even have a Bloody Mary before I came in here. But part of the plan was that there was a cost versus benefit analysis that was done. And Edward had specifically said that he thought that this was a component of the plan that was really stressed as part of the Build Act that he thinks helped propel it to be successful. and. Essentially, it was looking at certain benefits of this redevelopment from a standpoint of safety, health, um, property values, other, other aspects. There were a few other aspects. And to actually model that benefit, quantify that benefit, what would it mean for these different components if this happened? And compared that cost savings long term to the cost of building this through that, again, ultimately through that Build Act grant. So for every dollar that was put in to paying for the improvements, the model said that you could expect a dollar and 80 cents of benefits back based on those parameters. So it's, it's a pretty healthy exchange there, at least in, in my mind. Um, so, but I just wanted to bring that up, uh, but that's, that's all I had.